First John chapter one. <laughs> you, you, we're starting. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> In our time of conversation with you, I've been spending time beginning to tap into the words of the Apostle John. And the reason for that in the times that I have been teaching you is because this is the disciple that Jesus loved. Now, there had to be something in John that was unique other than just the fact that Jesus was who he was, but there, there was a relationship. Now, when Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, are you all with me? When I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. It brings it out of the outer court, lets you come through all the maze of religion of the inner court, and brings you into a place of contact with the living being who came in the flesh to represent the Father. And there was something, you know, I'm sure the other 12 disciples, the other 11, they had their connection. You know, when you hang out with somebody for three and a half years, don't you think if you hang out with somebody for three and a half years, you might get to know them? Now, these guys hung out with each other every single day. They didn't meet once on Sabbath and, you know, once a month on Fridays. I had to throw that in. My dry satire. And you, you would think that these guys that were hanging out with Jesus, how, how could Judas do what he did? Well, I mean, what got into him? You know what the Bible says? Satan entered into his heart. Those thoughts that Judas had were not his own. Then Peter, wow, the guy that said he would die for Jesus was the first one to run and deny him. Thomas, he didn't know what day it was. He wouldn't believe unless he saw. And yet there's this man, John. Now, John didn't have anything more going for him than the rest of them did. He was just a man. Are you tracking with me? Or was there something different in his, in his makeup? Could, could we learn something from John? And today we're always looking for role models. We're looking for somebody to pattern our lives after. We're looking, we're looking, for, we're looking for something that we can identify with. I wonder why, and I think I might know a little bit, why it was said of John, this is the disciple that Jesus loved. You mean he didn't love the other 11? Or was John his best friend? Do you think it's okay if Jesus has a best friend and it may not be you? Now, I say that just to have fun, relax, at ease. Because I think today it's a, it's a different order. I think where Jesus has come through and he, he came through the death and resurrection, re-glorification, and who he is. I think that dimension is slightly different than when he just walked here, or is it? When you see Jesus, will you have a relationship with him in that day? Or will you look at him from afar off while others are there in their relationship? It challenges me in relationship, period, is it not you? And since the Apostle John is one of the writers of the first four books of the New Testament, and then he has his other writings, which are more than just the record of he as a witness of those three and a half years, as a witness to what he heard and what he saw, he brought to us something that none of the others did. 
He brought us something in John chapter 1. And he, and he begins in John chapter 1 in the Gospels, one of the four Gospels. And then when he starts in 1 John 1, he starts right where he started off in John chapter 1 of the Gospels. Identifying Jesus as a living word who came in the flesh. God. A member of the Godhead that came and literally became one of us. Literally became a human. That's a real mystery still to me, and perhaps you, why God would do that and how he did it, but its scriptures are filled with how it happened. And we believe that because the witness is true. So this man, John, he begins not with talking about Jesus as his best friend, you'd think he would begin to say, hey, I was a disciple that Jesus loved. Look at me. Take a good look. He doesn't start that way. He begins to point us to his best friend. He takes every bit of emphasis off who he is. He diminishes everything about himself. And he begins to show us the second member of the eternal Godhead, the living word who came in the flesh, born of a virgin, to become one of us, that the Father through him could redeem us from this curse of death eternally. So, and we've, we've visited here, this is the third time I've visited 1 John chapter 1 with those that have been here in the times that I've been teaching. And you say, well, I've heard it already. So what? I learned you have to have heard something six times just to retain 25% of what you heard the first time. It is essential in today's... Now, I have a pressure in my spirit, man, about this subject. Because in today's world, who Jesus is, is being diminished into something else than he is. And who you are as sons and daughters is being obliterated in the name of Christianity and religion. Instead of you and I being the conscience of America, or are we still the conscience of America? It depends who you talk to. You can never be the conscience of America and remain silent. You're a conscience unto yourself. It may be time for us to be a little more vocal about what we believe. But what do you believe and why do you believe it? Or maybe you just heard it. Or if somebody asks you for the reason for your faith, are you able to go to the Word and read it to them? The Bible says when they ask you for the reason for your faith, you are to be able to go to the Word and read the Word to show them why you believe what you believe. Not as a parrot, not as somebody who can point that person back to somebody else, or to a book, or to a CD, or to a TV program, or to a church, or to, or to, or to a Bible study, or to, or to. But you are required to be on duty. I know when we come together here at Hope of the Generations Church, and you get me at this level, at times it has to be a love-hate relationship. And it does. That a guy recently gave me the greatest honor I've ever had in a conference. He came out to me at a conference, I think it was in, in Anaheim, three or four weeks ago. He said, you make me so upset and so mad, I can hardly stand it, but thank you. That is the highest compliment I can receive from anyone, because I got him thinking, whether he wanted to think or not. And if you're not thinking, you're probably stinking, with old knowledge, historical Branding on your walls. But are you a believer? Are you an oracle? John had a relationship. He didn't run like Peter did. He didn't sell the Lord as Judas did. And you could find John, I'm sure as confused as the rest of them, you could find him there right at the cross, looking up at his best friend, dying. Hearing his best friend look down through the blood and all the horror of that crucifixion 
and John standing down there next to Mary, Jesus' natural mother. And Jesus, looking through this maze of pain, looks at Mary and said, Mary, and looked at John, behold your son. John, behold your mother. In that day, the Lord, Jesus, entrusted his natural mother's welfare with his best friend. Is there anything within us that God can trust us with another's life? And then the biggest of all was when this apostle John in the Isle of Patmos thought his life was over in AD 96, just waiting to pass to the other side of the great divide, as they say. The Lord entrusted him with the most incredible book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So I guess if you want revelation, you need to be Jesus' best friend. Are you tracking with me? We come here not just to hear truth. Giving you truth is so easy, it's boring. Giving you revelation is difficult. Truth will not take you where you need to go. Revelation puts truth in motion. Because revelation requires faith. you got to mix what you heard with your faith, and that gives it motion. I have to say this in the past few years. I'm so glad. I studied the Bible when I did, because sometimes, even recently, the only straw I could hang on to was a living word and the faith in it. It brought me to the valley of the shadow of death. It brought me to a place that I'm talking to you today, the word. It's better than vitamin B. You need vitamin W. You need vitamin W, the Word. It will tell you how to think. The reason we don't think right is because we don't know the Word. And the Word that we have, we don't really live by it, but we certainly expect others to. Everything okay? Tyler has a testimony. You, you don't have a testimony? That's a testimony. You woke up this morning. I'm sure glad because I don't want to be seeing a ghost in this place except the Holy Ghost. 1 John, chapter 1, we won't read it again because you've heard it twice. That ought to be enough. Unless I gave you an open book test. John begins to talk about Jesus as the living word that came in the flesh. I've already taught this back from the Old Testament. Did you get to see that really who Jesus is in the past two or three times I've taught you? That he existed before he came in the flesh and who he was? Did you, did you kind of settle that? in your heart, what that's all about. Good. Verse 3, he begins to continue his journey. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Oh, boy, here comes the next hard part, that you may have fellowship with us. No, it wasn't having fellowship with us just because we're good buddies. It was because you agree on something. You weren't there. I was there. This is my witness. This is my witness. I was there. This is who he is. This is who he was before he came. Here's who came. Here's who died for you. This is the, and if he be raised from the dead, so you're going to be raised from the dead in the first resurrection. If you believe that and you believe who Jesus is and you believe our witness, then and only then do we have fellowship one with another. That means you cannot have fellowship with others that misrepresent the Godhead. One of the teachings of Mormonism, when I picked up a thing that the other day when I was in Seattle, they came knocking on my son's door. I brought it home with me, very first three or four pages in the teachings of Mormonism that every human existed before they were born in heaven and had fellowship with the Father. Now, because we have set, because they had such sweet fellowship with the Father as spirit beings in heaven. Now, the Father wants to prove their worth here by having them go through life as a human to be regained that fellowship later because they have proven themselves. That's sadistic. So I guess Adam wasn't formed from the dust of the earth. God didn't breathe into him. He became a living soul. There's so much stuff out here that's garbage, folks, knocking on your doors. And the growth of the false religions is greater than Christianity because the church doesn't know its word. Doesn't know. You must rest assured of who the Father is and who the Word is, who is Jesus and who the Holy Spirit is. 
you must have an understanding of the Godhead, that the fullness of the Godhead should be in the church in the earth, and it's not like it should. The fullness of the Spirit of God should be manifest to the corporate church in the, in the earth, and it's not like it should. So how come the fullness of the Godhead is not seen like it should? And how come the fullness of the Holy Spirit is not manifest as it should? So is our fellowship to continue with each other based on past historical success of others? Or do we mix our faith with their success and make it our journey of today? Or are we living on past revelation, past relationships of others? Or do we have one ourselves by faith? So what John is saying here, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you, that, that, this is a, an equation, that you may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Not just with Jesus, not just Jesus-centric, but our fellowship is with the Father and the Son as a work of the Holy Spirit. You know who the Father is of all spirits. You know who the living word. I like to help people understand the Godhead. The Father thought it, the Word said it, and the Holy Spirit did it. Thereby you have the action of thought, speech, and the action of such as expressed in creation. You find it right in Genesis. When God said, let there be light, the Holy Spirit was right there hovering over chaos, according to the will of the Father. So everything is, is the work of the Creator, the mind of the Father, the word of the Father, the power of the Father, the entire release of the Godhead into creation. And it is in Him, it is in Him, we live and move and have our being. In him, we live. That's life. Move. That's day by day and have our being. The very essence of who we are. Who are you anyway? Why are you here? Where'd you come from? Where are you going? Most people have no idea where they've come from as humans why they're here today, and where they're going, and less what happens to them after they die. Well, they say, well, I'm going to heaven. That is certainly a place that the believer's spirit goes to wait the resurrection, no question. But somehow they forget the rest of Scripture about what happens there. So we have all this superstition when there's so much Scripture available to us to indicate what happens in this journey to the first resurrection to the marriage supper of the Lamb, to the millennium, new heavens, new earth, and somehow it doesn't get taught. 